It is movie talk time, and on today's show, we are covering Star Wars specifically. Who is responsible for the next feature film we'll see on the big screen? On top of that, there are some clips from Aladdin circulating the internet right now, and uh, yeah, this panel might be divided on the quality of those clips. We will get into that soon enough. We have a wonderful show for you today, and I am so excited to share the desk with Silas and Koi. How you guys doing? Great. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> Always happy to have you here. And Koi, every single Tuesday. So excited to talk about You bring all the, the energy to the Ready room. Ready with it. Oh, man. There's a lot to cover today. So we're going to jump right into it with this Star Wars news. So the original report came from io9, and that outlet was saying that Bob Iger has confirmed that the next Star Wars film following episode nine will be a film from Game of Thrones showrunners Benioff and Weiss. Here is the specific quote. We did a deal with David Benioff and D.B. Weiss, who are famous for Game of Thrones, and the next movie that we we will release will be theirs. And we're not saying anything more about that. So that right there is it. One, does this surprise you guys? And two, what do you think it means for Ryan Johnson's films now that we've gotten the official word that Benioff and Weiss are moving forward first? I think it's not surprising the Ryan Johnson wise. I thought that it was going to be Ryan Johnson getting either a Disney Plus thing. I know they never said it, but I always felt like Disney Plus and doing a long form thing with him. They always talked about a trilogy, but after The Last Jedi, I feel like they were transitioning maybe elsewhere. I thought this trilogy was going to be Benioff and Weiss's from the beginning. Uh, we don't know if it's going to be Benioff Weiss, Ryan Johnson, Benioff Weiss. We don't know if these, like every two years, maybe they'll split it up. Maybe it's going to be six movies. They've announced three. Maybe they'll have movies coming out over the course of a longer time. But I feel like Ryan Johnson after The Last Jedi, though I enjoyed it publicly, uh, I think that enough people didn't that it put them in a tricky position. Now, whether or not that changes after last night's Game of Thrones or Sunday night's Game of Thrones, uh, whether or not they're going to have a similar... I mean, The Last Jedi and Episode 5 were very similarly problematic in the conversation of pop culture so i'm curious how this lands now that that episode has, has been so divisive and now that this season has been so divisive because when they hired them they were bending off and weiss of seasons one through seven of game of thrones now they are bending off and weiss of season eight of game of thrones so i don't know if that's going to change the conversation uh i do think that it is a tricky time for star wars because they're coming off a movie that was very polarizing leading into a movie trilogy with polarizing figures uh so i'm very curious because i personally understand some of the criticism Part of the reason why I was surprised to hear this today is because I started to really latch on to the idea that when we hear about the next Star Wars film, it was going to be a joint effort between Benioff and Weiss and Ryan Johnson. I thought they were going to kind of smooth things over by just uniting all the creative forces together, no matter what role that they each assume. So to hear this, and especially to hear this right now, because... I, for one, have really enjoyed season eight. I understand some of the criticisms. I have not had a big problem with much of anything in the show, but I'm very well aware that there's, you know, a pretty major outcry regarding what's happened in the season thus far. So I am a little surprised that this news, I mean, granted, it was, uh, I think this was an investor's call. This type of stuff is conveyed on those calls, but I was just a little surprised that they would have dropped this right now of all times. Although I, I think we live in a in a nerd world, and we hear all this complaints about Game of Thrones. I'm not sure that's true for the average person. I'm, I'm not sure, uh, especially on Bob Iger's side, that they are thinking, "Oh, there was such backlash, we we shouldn't say something." Um, but I totally agree with you. I was not at all surprised that we we knew that they. I, I think when it was first announced, they were doing um, film of Star Wars. It was said it was three films and that they were going to start as soon as Game of Thrones ended. And I thought the short season was assumed it's because they were doing Star Wars and budget. Like they said budget, but for me it was like, and because they're doing Star mm. Wars. So to me, the season got shortened. The story had to go faster, which is some of the criticism. And also we're going to be over there making that galaxy far, far away situation. So for me, the announcement was like, well, yeah. <laughs> and I also worry about the how the restructuring is going to go because yeah it was the biggest episode of game of thrones history like this episode five was the most viewership they've ever had so those might be the numbers they're looking at when they make this announcement i don't I, you might be right about the like whether it's the nerd culture of the coasts and like the, the circles we travel in like the, the film circles the rest of the country might have really enjoyed it but we're on film twitter we're seeing a very specific microcosm um i also think that some of the criticisms are unfair like what daenerys's choices were 
kind of in line with a lot of her arcs and a lot of the character choices that have been set up. But I think having such a short season, they didn't have time to ramp up to certain choices. Like we have to wrap this up in one more episode when it should have taken 10. Like those are things that I can see. So some of the criticisms are founded, some unfounded. That doesn't mean they're going to mess up Star Wars because they're not going to have those issues. They're getting a trilogy. They'll have plenty of time. Rationally speaking. Rationally speaking. Yes, that is true. Just hypothetically, let's play it out right now. What if the backlash continues as they wrap up the entire series and just the temperature in the room changes a little? I mean, it seems absolutely crazy to me to ever imagine anything changing their trajectory with Star Wars. They are committed. He dropped this announcement today. It is happening moving forward no matter what. Do you foresee kind of things, you know, dying out a little or this kind of talk stopping enough that we can just focus on how they are as creatives steering the Star Wars ship forward. What did you think of uh, Colin Trevorrow's Star Wars? Oh, it didn't happen. Oh, what about Lord Miller's Solo? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I really don't know if they're going to stay. Like, Ooh. Star Wars is falling apart. <laughs> I wow, <laughs> that, that was like a really upsetting way to put that. <laughs> and you did it with a big smile on your face too. I'm disturbed. I, I, I'm kind of happy with like, I, it, it, it's a shame to not have Ryan Johnson movies because Ryan Johnson movies are great. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully they will materialize in some way. But I like the three year wait before we, I, I, we don't know it's a trilogy they're starting, but I kind of think it is. And if I were betting man, I'd even say this is an old Republic trilogy. trilogy yeah. um, it, it it, it seems like even if there is a backlash, as soon as Star Wars fans see what this is going to be, they're going to get excited again. And I don't think that it necessarily is going to be like, well, those guys that made some episodes of a show that I loved for years and years and years, but then had a bad ending are going to ruin this. But at the same time, you look at um, like Scott Buck, right? Like he took over Dexter and that didn't go well. And then he took over Inhumans and that didn't go well. And then I don't know what he's doing now. Like there's there's also the other side. Like as things are great and then they start to dip off, that does cause like Colin Trevorrow, I don't think did Star Wars because of how poorly this next movie did after Jurassic World. Like I don't remember what even that movie was called, but the Book, the of, book of Henry. That's book. Yeah, <laughs> Look at Eli. <laughs> Denzel Washington flop. No, but like the Book of Henry, that I think was a pretty direct line of like. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious what is going to happen because they've had so much turmoil. The last five years have been just as tumultuous for Star Wars as the freaking prequel trilogy. Like I, I there have been a lot of highs, but there's been deeper lows. Like I love that Force Awakens is like such a, a giant domestic force of nature, and I like the Last Jedi. So what is Star Wars going to be after nine? Well, when I think about Colin Trevorrow, it like I didn't despise Book of Henry like most did, but given the fact that that was like a smaller movie to begin with. I would be so surprised if Disney execs looked at that and were like, well, we're done with him for Star Wars out of, no out of nowhere. Because look at most of your favorite filmmakers, your favorite showrunners, and look at their track record. Th there could be a hiccup along the way. That doesn't mean that they're not capable of making a good product again in the future. Things happen, especially when you produce so much content nonstop. The thing that concerns me nowadays is kind of what you guys said in terms of us living in in this vacuum where mm. the noise is just so, so loud and how, especially when it's something that happens within a fandom, because I think that's what happened with Ryan Johnson. Ryan Johnson did some things in Star Wars that many did not like. That's why it became problematic because it was within the Star Wars fandom already. And in this case, my concern is what if it's a similar type of talk for Game of Thrones? It's just... I wish the industry would sh would start showing a clear line in terms of where they're going to pay attention to the viewers out there and to the fans and to those who are super passionate about everything they see and the franchises they love, but also making smart executive decisions going forward that are somewhat removed from that. What I worry about is that the fandom... <sighs> Toxic fandom is getting powerful. Like it's getting more powerful. And then I, I, I'm speaking to what mm -hmm. you're saying and that, that there is a point where it's too much control from people that are angry on Twitter that wouldn't be saying these things if it wasn't anonymously. Like if that voice is too powerful because I'm actually kind of excited for Game of Thrones to end just so it's quieter. Like I'm, I'm excited for there to be peace. Like I'm, I'm excited for three years between Star Wars because I'm so tired. Like I, I don't want to be 
down because of fandom. I want to be uplifted because of fandom. I want to walk out of, of Shazam being like, yeah, look what they did. I want to walk out of Endgame just openly weeping. I want those feelings of emotion. And, and I think that that's what, how you should feel about these things. But when you're on Twitter for the next 48 hours after Game of Thrones episode and you're like, I feel gross and I need a shower, that's not fun. Nobody, nobody benefits. Mm-hmm. So I don't want that to be surrounding the Star Wars. I don't want to go into the Star Wars with these negative emotions. I, I think we're going to hit a point, though, with Disney Plus where we sort of like have our cake and eat it, too. Um, we can wait and see Star Wars on the big screen later, but we'll get the Mandalorian and the Rogue One series, and it sounds like a third series is on the way. Um, that's cool to me. Yeah. The, the universe gets to continue, but movies become something special. Do you think Ryan Johnson's going to end up in Disney Plus? I don't know. I, I I wonder exactly what was being pitched and and what happened. It may be that he was trying to come up with an idea, and it may be something that we won't see for ten years. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe it does work on Disney Plus and becomes a, a Disney Plus show. The thought of maybe Ryan Johnson moving over to that third show or the third show that I I believe they're planning. I don't think it's an actual locked thing right now. Iger basically said for that. My guess is there will probably be one more, as in one more show on Disney Plus, at least one more live action series that we produce for Disney Plus, meaning a Star Wars series before we release the next film. That doesn't surprise me, and I think it kind of behooves them to put all of their eggs in the Disney Plus basket before we get this next film, especially with such a long hiatus. And this could kind of change the tone of the conversation, too. I have so much faith in The Mandalorian after seeing that footage of Star mm-hmm. Wars Celebration. I'm very excited for casting because I love Rogue One. And then with the third one, I kind of like the little rumor going around out there that maybe it has something to do with Obi-Wan Kenobi, especially because I'm like three quarters of the way through Master and Apprentice right now, the book that Claudia Gray just released. And there are just like so many different layers to Obi-Wan that it's like I was aware of, but I'm fully experiencing. And to have that character fleshed out even more so on a series, that sounds like it has so much potential. I I, want to see Obi-Wan and uh, Uncle Owen stuck together for some reason, like Midnight Run, but like out in the Star Wars universe. So I I want there to be series that take place within the universe we know and then I'm really excited to expand it. I'm I'm hoping this this trilogy is, the Old Republic isn't as mainstream as other stuff, so it's exciting for people that love the Star Wars lore, but also we get to branch out from the Skywalkers. So I'm excited that Nine is concluding concluding that saga, but I would love to see, we don't know a lot about Uncle Owen, that'd be fantastic. I hope Disney Plus leans into the mythology more. Before we move on to our next topic, let's weigh in on this suggestion from Sky Patterson. He says, I think and believe that Quentin Tarantino should direct a bounty hunter horror film set in the Star Wars universe with Benioff and Weiss producing slash scripting. The second you drop in the word horror, I'm sold, (laughs) even though I know it limits the viewership, but I don't know. I'm kind of in. (laughs) I think that Tarantino doing Star Trek and Star Wars would be quite the thing, and I think that Star Trek's movie's back on, so why not? Yeah, pull pull a JJ, (laughs) Quentin. Let's see what happens. Yay, nay? I'm more... I want to see his Star Trek. Okay. I feel like The Clash is there a bit more. Like It's very easy for me to imagine him doing a bounty hunter movie, because we've seen him do stories about bounty hunters. (laughs) Um... I, I, Star Trek is is a bigger clash for me, and that's why I think it's in, more interesting. All right, all right. Got a little bit of a di- divide mm-hmm. going on here, but they all land in good spots, I think. All right. Before we move on to our next topic, which is, of course, those Aladdin clips, we got a little tease for something coming your way on the Collider Video YouTube channel. Check it out. Hi, I'm Amy Dallin, one of the hosts of Collider Heroes. And starting right now, you can catch our show at a new time and format. We're coming at you Tuesday nights with a new shorter Collider Heroes and a longer Collider Heroes podcast where Koi and I are going to talk your ears off. You already know that's coming. So make sure to go to YouTube, subscribe, and find us on the Collider Heroes podcast feed for all of that sweaty goodness. Do not miss the next episode of Collider Heroes, guys. Amy and Coy are doing an A-plus job with that show, and I'm not just saying it because he's at this desk right now. I mean, I know her. She's great. Job well done. Thank you, thank you. Also, tomorrow on Collider, you are getting a very special episode of FYC for your consideration. That's with me. It's with Scott Mance. It's with Jeff Snyder, and we are doing a special episode in honor of Avengers Endgame because we've got some Oscar predictions, even though the Oscars are so far away. There could be some kind of game-changing opportunities for the superhero genre this year as far as awards contenders go. So we dig into it tomorrow, Wednesday, 1 p.m. Pacific time. Check it out then. All right, Aladdin. So there's a bunch of clips for Aladdin out there. And 
I am unimpressed. You could probably tell by the tone of my voice. But before I <laughs> dig into what I do not like, where do you guys stand on this? Do you have faith in Guy Ritchie's Aladdin? Or do these clips suggest that Disney might have severely missed the mark with this one? I'm optimistic. I... I don't have the same nostalgia for the Disney Aladdin, mm -hmm. though. Um, when I was a kid, my family moved to France for a year, and it was the year Aladdin came out. <laughs> so I, I saw it later on uh, on uh, home video, but I, I don't have this like childhood thrill of it should be exactly like the cartoon I remember. And I'm optimistic about the movie. Um, the, the clips haven't necessarily super impressed me, but at the same time, I don't... I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Okay, Koi, I'm wedging myself in here because I want to sandwich myself between the positivity and the excitement. <laughs> I do have a ton of nostalgia. Aladdin growing up was such a big deal to me. It was always about Aladdin and The Lion King. Those were my favorite, and still to this day, my favorite Disney animated movies. I love them. I love the music, everything. In particular, when I queued up the, the Prince Ali one today, because the other ones, it was almost like I was giving it a chance. I'm like, this doesn't feel right, but I can kind of find little silver linings. I'm going to stay uh, hopeful. I like Guy Ritchie. I have some faith in Will Smith. Then I see this, though, and that's... That scene is supposed to be filled with kind of so much infectious energy. And while this one is kind of bathed in color all over the place, there's something about it that, I don't know, it, it didn't get me going at all. And it's almost like, it's almost like the song plays at a much slower pace. It felt like a drag. There's so much going on in like that teeny tiny frame, yet I found myself like, not necessarily bored, but just kind of waiting for the next part of the spectacle to happen. I was so disappointed when I saw that clip today. The other, the other ones that we've seen, they're not the worst things in the world. It was basically the scene that basically tees up a whole new world. And then also that bit between uh, Will Smith and Mina Masood, where I think they title it, I Wish to Become a Prince, and he shows him some of his magic and all that. Those were fine. Not great, but fine. This one has me more worried than I've been this entire run. I'm exactly I'm with you. <laughs> Aladdin and The Lion King are exactly my two up until Emperor's New Groove. Uh, Aladdin, Lion King, Emperor's New Groove are my top three. And those two were my childhood to the point where I had Aladdin and Jasmine. I called them action figures. They were dolls, straight up. Uh, and I loved them dearly. And I, in fact, my Mother's Day post yesterday of me being very excited with my mom sitting next to me is me opening Aladdin Hanes undies. Aladdin was my boy. But... I think this is an opportunity for me to own the fact that I was such an Aladdin fan and I'm such a diehard Guy Ritchie fan that nothing has dissuaded me because I'm blindly going into this. I, I'm, I think I'm dumbly excited. Here's a question for you, though, because I'm a big Guy Ritchie fan, too. It's just if I didn't know who directed this movie. It looks not like a Guy Ritchie movie. Never in a million years would I guess that this was his movie. It doesn't look movie. like a Guy Ritchie movie and it doesn't look like Aladdin to me. And yet, since I love those two things so much, it's like I love mint chip ice cream and I love cookies so when I make a mint chip ice cream cookie sandwich there's no way I won't enjoy it even if it looks like it's melted and old I'm still gonna eat it and I feel like that's this Aladdin thing I love the ingredients so much even if there's mold on it I'll probably try it so no. uh, this trailer has some mold on it and yet I love the ingredients so much I'm gonna be there opening day to eat this moldy sandwich there is some sort of genius pull quote in whatever you just <laughs> said and I want to see it on the poster so so badly Disney's like well I don't even moldy sandwich I guess we're sold that I guy. I feel like you but, easily put everything into perspective when you turn something into an ice cream sandwich. I'm just, that's what I'm here for, guys. Every <laughs> Tuesday, your ice cream sandwich metaphors and Collider Movie Talk. But it does have, like, it looks more Basil Lerman-y to me. Uh, the edits are way more sweeping and pushing than his usual kinetic editing style. And I really thought that that would lend itself well to a musical. I thought we'd get this Guy Ritchie frenetic energy insane editing. And instead, we have these sweeping vistas and large shots, which doesn't feel like Guy Ritchie. And the two scenes of Aladdin... I feel like it's someone doing like a play. It doesn't quite feel like a spectacle film, even though it's got all the spectacle ingredients. And yet I'm so blindly excited, I'm in. Like they can literally show me garbage and I'm like, but it's Aladdin garbage. Uh, I, think Alad I think Lion King looks perfect. So that's actually a detriment to Li Aladdin though. Like Lion King, everything I've seen, I'm like more. Whereas yeah. Aladdin, I'm like, I'll just go, please stop. I'm hopeful for Lion King. We have some, uh, some folks in the live chat chiming in right now. The third turd wrote, I just hope the lovely Naomi Scott's career can survive this. Oh. I, have, I have a lot of faith in her because, yes, this movie isn't looking too hot. Power Rangers didn't pan out probably like she had hoped, but she does have that Charlie's Angels movie coming up. She's clearly in demand, so 
I still see good things in her future. We also have Ryan King who says, I'm waiting for the live action Hunchback of Notre Dame movie. That's my favorite. I hope they don't screw that up. And then we've got one more from MBB. Aladdin will make more money than Godzilla 2, but get much worse reviews. Where do you guys fall actually on Aladdin's box office? Because yesterday on Movie Talk, I said that there was no way that Aladdin opening weekend was cracking 100 million. And many out there did not agree with me, but I still stand by that comment. I don't think, I, I don't even think we're talking about like a $95 million opening where it falls just short. I don't think we're coming anywhere close. I think it's Aladdin and I think it's Disney and I think that it can have a seven Rotten Tomatoes score and it'll still make a hundred million dollars. I like Dumbo didn't work out for a lot of reasons, but they also didn't really advertise Dumbo as much as they're advertising Aladdin. I feel like a kid is going to cry and get his parents to see Aladdin times 500 and it's going to make all the money. Like I don't, I don't think it can't not make a lot of money. I also think that uh, Aladdin has nostalgia going for it, Mm. um, which Dumbo does not necessarily. I think everybody watches Dumbo as a kid, but they they maybe remember it as a sort of sad, weird story with a cute elephant. Aladdin is is a lot of people where kids are now parents and want to take their kids to the movies. Two thirds of us, like you know, we're like we're zealots of Aladdin, and I feel like almost no matter what, like I'm seeing it. If I had kids, I'd be they'd be crying to see. It. Like it's gonna make money. Yeah, it's it's gonna make money. I'm still sticking with my sub $100 million opening weekend prediction. Before we wrap up the show, I've got some questions here. Here is one from Thelonious, who's asking, Midsummer looks great, but why does the director like movies about cults? Is this an informal trilogy forming? Did you guys watch the Midsummer trailer today? Yeah. How good does that look? I'm really excited. I... I I didn't love, I think I was oversold on Hereditary the first time, and mm-hmm. since I have watched it on Blu-ray, and it, it has really, really grown on me. Um, I also, one of my favorite horror movies is The Wicker Man, and this totally looks in the vibe of The Wicker Man. I did not see it because I was filming Heroes, but I am excited for it nonetheless, blindly, because of the director's work. I also love how different it looks like color-wise from Hereditary. It looks like it's going to stand out. It looks like it's going to prove that Ari Aster isn't just, like, that was his his uh, feature directorial debut, and sometimes that happens, and then all of a sudden someone fizzles out. I have a feeling he's going to combine these and basically show us, like, look at this range and this style and how creepy I can make such different things. So this trailer just completely sucked me into that world. It freaked me out. It had me looking every which way trying to figure out what was going on. I absolutely loved it. Can't wait for that movie. All right. Before we go, Rick Amoris, I will say what you said, even though I don't agree. Aladdin will make $100 million on opening weekend, and it will drop about 70%. That's a big weekend to drop, but I wouldn't be surprised if that still happened, but with under $100 million opening weekend. What's the weekend after Aladdin? Godzilla. Oh, yeah. And that's uh, pretty... um, Rocket Man. Yeah, and that's going to be the, not and the same audience, but similar. Ma- yeah, Mama it's, it's a too? busy month. This, well, this, this summer is that insane. Burn? I, don't I think know. <laughs> I'm confusing the last two weekends of May here. Either way, this May is insane. So I, I do see a large drop. I do see it doing like not as great word of mouth. And I do think the Rotten Tomato score will affect it the second week. But I think all the zealots are going to be there no matter what, even if it's the worst sandwich ever. Ice cream sandwich. Just get one <laughs> today. Cream. Everyone, you know what? <laughs> Just We're done now. So go home. Go to the store. Make your own ice cream sandwich, <laughs> preferably without any mold on it. Koi, Silas, thank you guys so much for joining me today. It is a blast. As always, Adam in the booth. You rock. Thanks for your hard work. Guys, tell everybody you know about Collider Movie Talk, both on the YouTube channel and in podcast form as well. You can take us on the go. We love doing this show. Your support is greatly appreciated. And guess what? We'll see you tomorrow, 3 p.m. PT, live for a brand new episode.